A Billion Suns Interstellar Fleet Battles by Mike Hutchinson. Holy cats, this is a Mike Hutchinson design. Part of the Osprey Blue Book series, I'm not going to do a review. I'm not going to do an in-depth look at how to play the game. We're going to just dive in. But before I do dive into the game, let me warn you about one of the things that Mike Hutchinson does. He, of course, wrote Gaslands, and if you've ever played Gaslands, you know that he loves to take a core concept of miniature wargaming. One of the five M's, move, magic, missile, melee, morale, and make it crazy easy to implement. Not to provide a simpler experience, but simply so that he can add additional complexity elsewhere. In this case, he simplified moving and shooting your little spaceships so that he can dedicate the complexity to the objectives. The first thing we should probably talk about is getting this game to the table. I am going to be using cardboard chits because I am away from home, and man, does this thing require a pretty sizable collection of spaceships. It also requires a sizable collection of terrain and objective markers. We'll talk more about those in a moment. We've got jump points. Notice that the ships get bigger and smaller. The size 4 ships, we've got carriers, we've got size 3 ships, medium utility ships, and yeah, monitors, corvettes, frigates, and then you also have smaller ships, little gunboats and light utility vessels. These are either shipping or mining vessels, and then we've got our selection of fighters. I have made my pentagonal ships to point the direction. Now, all of these ships are points in, other wo in space. In other words, when my carrier is here, he really exists at the tip of the spear. And then I like this design because what it does is the ships have a firing arc of 45 degrees to their front for their primary weapon, and their auxiliary weapons have a 180 degree firing arc. This particular carrier would be able to shoot at anything in this space with its auxiliary weapons. When it moves, it's very simple. This little three, I even put the stats down on there. We're, do, we're going full hex encounter. Well, I mean... We're not going full hex, but we are going full counter. The three is how far it can move, and as usual, because I'm gaming in a small space, I will be using centimeters. He can pivot, and he can actually pivot pretty much however he wants to, but if he over pivots more than 90 degrees, then there's going to be issues with what you can do later on. So we pivot, let's say we just pivot 45 degrees, and then we move three, and kapow, we're done with movement. Shooting is very simple. Let's take a look at the carrier's ship record, and we'll have him shooting at a Corvette. So we take a look at the ship record, and the carrier, as you see, it costs, well, we'll get to cost in a second, has a mass of three. That makes it one of the larger ships, the thrust of three. Silhouette is seven. You have to roll that or lower to hit it, and then it has shields of five. We'll talk about that in a second. Its weapons are, oh man, I'm really good at this, aren't I? It doesn't have any weapons. All right, fine. We're having a Corvette shooting at the carrier. The Corvette, on the other hand, see, look. It's got a silhouette of seven. That's the number you need to roll to hit. And shields of five. The Corvette has a silhouette of five and shields of two. So our Corvette is now shooting at our carrier. And the Corvette, as you can see here, it can move ten inches. Oh, look, I put a little ten for the thrust. It's got turbo blasters in its primary weapon system. The turbo blasters have a range of 0 to 6 centimeters, and they roll 4d6. V easy peasy, we roll 4d6, and remember, we need to roll a 7 or less. Oh, the carrier is a sitting duck. That's okay. If the Corvette gets close enough, he's going to roll, and look, all of the dice are less than 7. They're all hits. Oh, this is not. If you roll the maximum value on a die, it's a dud auto-miss. These two are hits. This is a critical hit. It counts as two hits. We have now hit struck the carrier four times. So he gets to make four saving throws, and his shields are five. Oh, you thought this was going to be a cakewalk? For every five or less, we negate one of those hits. So these three didn't penetrate the strong shields. This one does. So the carrier takes, well, how much damage do turbo lasers do? One point of damage. Easy peasy. If we had fired a cruise missiles at this guy, suppose we had a destroyer instead. Suppose we had a destroyer. Where's my destroyers? 
There we go. He's one of the big boys. Notice, and I think this is really fascinating. Notice that the cruise missiles have a range of 18 to 36 inches. They roll 3d10 and do 3 damage. All right, so they're now 18 centimeters apart, and I have to roll 3d10. Again, I need to roll 7 or less in order to hit. This is the maximum value. It's a dud. I have rolled two hits. We're saving. And look at that. Because we're using a more powerful weapon, there is a greater chance that the shields are not effective. So we roll our two dice, and we get one save. We've rolled under five with this one and over five here. Because this hit is not saved, we have to go back and look at the cruise missile damage. The ship takes three damage tokens. I am going to be using... The classic, stand, the old standby, he takes three points of damage. Is that enough to destroy him? Maybe. What is his mass? Oh, look, it's three. That means, yeah, we're going to destroy that cruiser with that one hit. Pretty easy, right? All right, now here's where things get a little bit more challenging. This is our handy cheat sheet, which... This may be the first Osprey game I've seen that includes a useful cheat sheet. When you activate your vessel, you have to choose what orders you're going to give. You can vector, which is essentially a run in standard parlance. You can pivot, move, pivot, move. You can engage, select, engage, target, in primary arc to gain rerolls against. In other words, that roll that we had... The 3D10s when we launch those cruise missiles. If we rolled and we ordered, if we just did a standard move and we rolled engage, then, oh look, we could re-roll this. I mean, it's not a miss, but we could re-roll it. And now we got three hits altogether. You can do red alert. If your ship is alive and it's got damage tokens, discard. Once you're done moving, see, you issue the orders, then you move. Then you remove D3 damage tokens and then jump out. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty good. As far as the engage is concerned, I, I believe with, I need to double check. I, I think on the vector movement, you cannot use your primary weapon or is it auxiliary? I'll look and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But that's kind of the middle of the, of the game. The actual round goes command phase. And this is where you get command tokens that give you not just these special abilities for orders, but special abilities throughout the turn. And Reveal Helms, we're not going to worry about that because this is a solo game. This is, you really, this is really for multiplayer games. You roll off initiative. We know how that works. Then there's a thing called jump phase. You're going to drop to get onto the table. And this is really interesting. You don't build a fleet the way you do in a standard Starship game. Instead, you will deploy a jump gate. And then you will purchase ships on the fly. Ah, I'm going to drop in a Corvette. That takes one of these command tokens to drop your jump point. It takes another command token to drop your Corvette. And you purchase your ships as you go because it's not enough to meet your objectives. You have to meet your objectives with the minimum amount of expenditure possible. To give you an idea of what the expenditures are, your fighters your little Mass 1 ship, Mass 0 ships, uh, recon it didn't quite fit. You, you, you do the best you can, right? Cost 1, 2, and 3. Your little light utility ships that allow you to secure those objectives cost $1, if you will. And then your big boys, your destroyers are 12. A battleship, a great big honking battleship. They look a little something like this. Oh, look, they look... Oh, it's you, you're going to be astonished to learn that they look like a Corvette, only a lot bigger. Very slow, very easy to shoot, powerful shields. And look at these guns. They've got the Planet Smasher. 12 to 24, you're rolling 4d12. Not the most accurate weapon. If you're firing this Planet Smasher at fighters with a silhouette of two, oh, you're only hitting, you've only, you're only going to hit one in six times, although you do get four chances. One in six times. But man, fighters don't have shields, and if you hit, you're doing five damage a piece, which is great because it means that your capital ships are really well suited for going after other capital ships. Fighters should be slinging after other fighters, right? Very clever game design. 
But the point is, if I'm spending 40 points on a battleship, I better make darn sure that there are 40 victory points on the table that I can secure. 41. If I secure 40 victory points in exchange for a battleship, I broke even. Didn't do me any good. So what do I mean by victory points? I, be patient. We'll get to that. Before we get to the victory objectives, let's take a look at the helm. If you really want to go first, you'll put one of your command tokens into initiative. In the case of a solo, and that's that's what this is up here. How many credits have you spent versus how much profit have you made? That's going to be important. For seize initiative, in the solo game, it's a little different. For every token I put in this box, I get to move one of my battle groups. It's a collection of one or more ships of the same size. The same type, I should say. And then, all of the bad guys, AI-driven bad guys, get to go. And then all of the rest of my ships get to go. Then we look down here at Tactical, and this is where things really get interesting. Combined orders. At the start of any activation, a single token will allow three unactivated friendly battle groups, so you can move multiple groups, if they're within three inches of each other, to move at the same time. And that is how you wind up having a situation where I've got a battleship who is being escorted by a corvette and a screen of fighters. Normally, I would have to move my corvette, and then the other guys could come storming in. But if I'm spending my command tokens, I can move all three of these battle groups at the same time, and so long as I stay within three inches, the ships stay within three inches of each other, I can do some combined movement. Very useful. But we also have these other ones, power to dampeners. Once at the start of a battle group's movement phase, spend it to permit this battle group to shoot its primary weapon, even if it performed a high G maneuver. We should talk about that. A high G maneuver is where, so here's my battleship, and I'm going to pivot him more than 90 degrees and move two inches. That's a high G maneuver. I can't fire unless I spend a command token saying, yeah, juice up the inertial dampeners. This is the, the big F you to Isaac Newton. Executive order. Spend a command token to reroll a single die of any type. Oh, you missed your, your you've got that D6 shield that's going to, oh, and look, I, I rolled bad. And, and I didn't make my shield take, well, I can spend a token, reroll that one, and not take any damage. We also have power to engines. At the start of a friendly battle group's movement, spend this to double the thrust value. My battleship, I really need him to get across the table. I'm going to spend a token, and he's going to get to move four. If I engage, then I can pivot and move another four. So this guy can kind of move across the table, but only if I'm spending a command token. We also have power to weapon systems. Before you roll an attack, spend up to mass command tokens to subtract one from the result. This is a mass three ship. For every command token I spend, when I'm rolling my big rail guns, my planet smasher, so let's say I spend three tokens, now each of these dice I subtract three. If I roll the 12, oh look, it's highly unlikely, that it's much less likely that my planet smasher rolls a dud, misses with a 12. But in this case, because I spent those two, I've turned my 10 into an 8, and I'm much more likely to hit. So that's kind of useful. And then power to shields. If a shield value of one or more is targeted after the dice are rolled, you can spend tokens. So this, this allows you, after the dice are rolled, you can spend your tokens to add plus one to the shield value. Again, my, my battleship just got raked by a flight of three enemy fighter groups, well, guess what? I'm going to go ahead and, and spend the command token. Uh, after the dice are rolled, I get plus one to my shield value. Oh, but you know what? Sixes, I think sixes always fail in this. So I probably wouldn't spend it there, but I might spend it on my Corvette. My Corvette got raked, and uh, he's only got a shield value of two. I spend, is it up to the mass? So my Corvette has a mass of, I think, two. I can spend two, and now his shield is four, and when I roll the save... Look at all those failures. But I, well, I mean, it actually didn't make any difference here. But, but look, there we go. Oh, look at that. It turned these two failures into successes, and now only one hit got through. Aren't we glad we spent those two tokens? I should say so. I'm still not to the point where we're ready to talk about objectives. And that's because they're really complicated.
Normally, you would break out a deck of cards. You pull out the Jack, Queen, King, and Ace of each suit, and you deal three cards until you've got one card of three of the different suits, and then those cards will tell you what your mission is, what your objectives are. I didn't do that. Instead, I used... There's a, there's a, there's a mission generator, I guess you could say, over on, I think it's billionsons.space. I don't know. Go look at Planet Smasher games and look up Billion Suns. It's there. And that generates, see, look, a Jack of Hearts, a Jack of Spades, and a Queen of Diamonds. So these are the three missions I'm going to use for the first game. I already did it for the second and third games. That's what the number up there is for. So let's take a look at, at what we're actually trying to do. You have to set up one planetoid. All right, well, that's easy. I, I'm using... This, and remember, this is the hearts. So I'm going to take my my planetoid for hearts. There you go. So you got the little Planet Smasher logo on there. And then you, oh, end of round one. So this is an evacuation contract. At the end of round one, moving from the sea, well, that's me, place a lifeboat in contact with the planetoid until there are S lifeboats. Now, we didn't talk about scale. Basically, the higher the scale, the more... Uh, objectives there are. So if we're playing a scale 3 game, then I would put three lifeboats around this planet. And at the end of round 1, we put those down. Uh, at the end of round 2, lifeboats that are not controlled by a CEO move 4 inches away from the center of the planet, or 4 centimeters in this case. Well, wait, what do you mean controlled by a CEO? I brought a gunboat in, and I got my gunboat to within 3 centimeters of this lifeboat. I scan it. And if there are no enemy vessels within three inches, I gain control of that lifeboat. Which means on the next turn, if I can get that lifeboat back to the jump point and jump him out, I score victory points. How many victory points, I hear you ask? I've pulled out the one, two, and three of diamonds and made a little mini deck. The diamonds are shuffled and placed face down. The first lifeboat to jump out, you get to draw a card. And that ace means I scored two dollary dues. If I had a second lifeboat that also jumped out, I would draw the next card. And that one was worth six dollars. So those two lifeboats, getting them out of the system, earned me eight credits in revenue. Which, remember, that gunboat cost me three to get on the table. So I'm up five at this point in our little example. The other two contracts that we have are InfoWars, set up plus one table. Well, wait a minute. You mean I got to play multiple tables? Not got to, get to. I don't actually need to set up a second table. I can split this one in half. And here's where I need to turn my attention to a very curious part of the, of the rule set. And this is one that really made me scratch my head until I watched old uh, Ash Barker over there at Gorilla Miniatures Game play, and he kind of kind of schooled me on exactly what's going on here. Because in most games, you will have a section that says you need to use a table that is four by four, six feet by four feet, two by foot by two foot. Mike, oh Mike, he gives you no real help here. He says, hey, you know what? The number of tables is determined by the contracts, but hey, look, you know, you, you, you just whatever, man. Just agree on a surface that will count as, quote, tables. And, um, you know, like, whatever, bro. It's designed to be flexible. Yeah, we're going to lean into that. Ash got a couple of different play mats. I think they were all either two by two, I think he used. I'm just going to use this one. And again, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm gaming in a small space. This is a square of fabric that I bought at Walmart for like a dollar seventy-seven, and oh, I should have kept I should have kept the label. But to give you an idea, there's thirty, and there's about seventeen. It's about forty-seven by about fifty-five centimeters. So if you want to think of it as about three by five feet, if you want to scale it up, that's fine. What we're gonna do is use our good friend, Mister Masking Tape. And I'm going to, now I needed a second table, so I can cut this in half. And on the second table, well, wait a minute, how do I move between tables? I hear you ask. Look, there's a jump point, there's a jump point. 
I can't move from one table to the next. I have to jump into one or the other. But when I'm done achieving my objectives, I can go to this jump point. And instead of going back to HQ, I can jump to the other table. That is fascinating. So anyway, the, the InfoWar contract is really easy. Each phase, starting around two, the CEO with Mac, most hat commsats. What does that mean? Oh, we got to put commsats down on the table. Again, if we're playing a scale three game, then I've got these three delightful little chits that I can put down. Oh, do I put them on the one table? Or can I put them on any table? That's a great question. I don't know. I got to look it up. We'll deal with that in the next video. This, this one kind of got out of hand. I didn't think I wanted to go through the whole rules, but I, maybe it's useful. And when we sit down to actually play the game, let's call this a bonus episode. I'll throw this up uh, outside of my regular Tuesday, Thursday lineup. Uh, right, so for, for these guys, you, what you want to do is get close enough to scan it. And if you scan it, you've hacked it. And if it was previously hacked by another player, so I come up and I go, boop. Oh, I now control that. I'm going to put a little green bead on it to show y'all that I hacked that comm set. And then I go off to try to achieve my other objectives. And then Mr. Red comes by with his gunship and says, boop, I'm going to hack it back. And then we take the green off and we put a red bead to show that he hacked it. All right, so you need a lot of beads in this game. From round two, the CEO with the most hacked comm sats unhacks one of their commsats, gains dollars from the top of the spade deck, and discards it. Repeat until there are no hacked commsats. So unhack, gain credits, and then repeat until you're done. Spades work a little different. You put them in order, face up. The first guy to achieve his objective gains two credits. The second guy gains four it, you multiply the number by the number of players. In the case of a solo game, I was right. You multiply by the number of CEOs. That means we've got three objectives. Three times six points per deck. What was that last one? The last one is going to be the diamonds. We'll look at that one in some detail, too. So six times three is 18, and then double that. There are 36 credits available. That's going to limit if you grabbed every single objective using a battleship, you would still lose four credits, and you would basically lose that scenario. But as I said, we still have one more set of objectives. Mining contract. Set up another table. Wait, we've got three tables. Oh, boy. We're going to be all over the place. No, wait, is that right? Yeah, no, it's one, it's one table, two tables, three tables. Yeah. So you're going to be a little small. That's all right. Scan an asteroid. If this is the first time, so what do we got to do? We got to add three asteroids. Remember, we're doing scale three. And I've got one, two, th two, three asteroids to throw down. And in this case, you scan the asteroid. And if this is the first time it has been scanned, draw a diamond. Well, wait a minute. We already did the diamond deck. The diamond deck is in random order placed face down. The hearts deck, and the hearts deck, remember, was for the lifeboats. That is arranged in descending order, face up with the highest card. So the hearts deck, for the lifeboats, you actually get six for the first one. And then four for the second lifeboat, and two for the last. For the mining contract, when you scan that asteroid, you draw a diamond card. These are shuffled in place face down. Before removing, then you shoot up the asteroid, and we can talk a little bit about what that takes later. Uh, I have, well, no, let's do it right now. There's no sense waiting. The asteroid has a mass of two and a silhouette of nine and no shield. So you got to blast it, and it doesn't take much because you only have to roll a nine or lower, and you only have to do two damage to break it apart. When you break that up, then you put ore tokens equal to the value of the card. So let's just draw one at random. These might be in order. Let's just do two. So kablow, look at that. We blew this guy up. And now I'm going to put three... What should we use for ore? Let's use purple beads. Three purple beads. Bing, bing, bing. So now we got our three chunks of ore. Each ship may collect up to two mass ore tokens in scan range. Oh, this is utility ship. So this is where you were going to want to purchase these. 
A light utility ship is a mass of one. When the light utility ship scans the ore, we put the ore on the utility ship. And uh, if you, let's see, scan a friendly jump point. So if we get to the jump point, then we gain dollars equal to the ace. So that's worth two points. In the case of a medium utility ship, I can scan these three. I can take two of them. And if I get this utility ship back and scan it, that means I'm, I'm shoving my ore through the wormhole. And, uh, man, do I want to make some jokes? I'm not going to. But I earn four credits for doing just that. And that is pretty much it. Now, as I said, I, boy, I didn't really want to go through all the rules. I didn't think, but apparently I do. There are some other little wrinkles, stuff that may be kind of hard to remember. But now you see... That what I mean when I say this is such a Mike Hutchinson game, the actual moving and shooting, it's not a lot to it. But just imagine now, when we sit down to play this game, we're going to have three tables. We're going to have to jump ships in, and we're going to have to be very judicious with how we apply our ships. The nice thing is, you build your fleet on the run. You don't have to have... I mean, you get to choose based on the the objectives that you face. That is great from a gameplay perspective, but it does make it difficult to assemble a fleet. I thought that if I bought the airships from Irregular Miniatures, I'd be good to go. There's five over here. There's eight over here. I was thinking in full thrust terms. I was thinking in Battlefleet Gothic terms. I was thinking in terms of, I'm going to buy my fleet and then we're just going to go play the game. Not the case here. The bad news is it makes it really hard to get enough materials together to play this game. Mike tries to ease you in by having this concept of scale. A scale 3 game means you're going to have 6 command tokens and you're only going to have 36 possible victory points. Which means you're really only going to be bringing on 12 to 15 points worth of ships, which is only going to be five to six ships, if you want to have a reasonable expectation of victory. But which ships? And as long as you're assembling a fleet, you might as well go whole hog and assemble the full fleet. As I said, rather than wait any longer, I went ahead and just made up these tokens and cut them out, and they show direction and relative sizes, and I think it works really well. If you want to get your hands on these Grab a glue stick, glue them to cereal box packet. That's what I did. It's actually not cereal box packet. It's not cereal. It's actually, I thought it would be appropriate. These are from Trader Joe's Cheesy Rocket Crackers. You know, it, it, it's the breakfast of gamer champions. I thought that would be appropriate, the, the Rocket Crackers. At any rate, this isn't even, you might even need more ships than I've shown here. I went ahead and made four of each kind of fighter groups. There are recon fighters that are fast and weak, but good at scanning. There are bomber fighters that are fast and fairly good at shooting. And then kind of in between are these just straight fighters. You've got four of the, you've got two of these class, these mass one ships, gunships and light utility ships. Light utility ships are good at scanning. They're reasonably quick. Gunships are where you start getting into the big guns, of course. And then you've got your larger, slower, medium utility ships, corvettes, monitors, and frigates. And then I went with just one each of the capital ships, a carrier, cruiser, battleship, and destroyer. So if you run the numbers, each one of these groups has, this is going to be 12, 24, and then another 12. So we're looking at about 36 to 40 ships each. Pretty big chunk of change. Then you look at the various installations that you might need. There are space krakens, criminal ships. This one's a little sus. This is a civilian ship that if you scan it, it might wind up being a space pirate. In which case, that's the only one that I really have that you flip over. Uh, and then again, the lifeboats, the asteroids, the commsats. And you need one asteroid for every scale. If you bump up to the fact point that you're playing scale 8 games... Well, now I've got eight cards in each of my three decks. And that means I've got, well, I've got 24 cards, and I don't need to run the numbers because Mike was kind enough to do that for us. If you're playing with 
a scale eight game, there are a total of 36 card points, credits in the deck. And if you're only playing with two players, that means there's 200 points on the board. Well, now you're getting to the point that I, you might want to spend 75 points, and that might mean bringing on a carrier, which can kind of act like a jump ship. The one, wonderful thing about the carrier is, as he's trundling around, boop, 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 you can use him to summon a fighter jet, a fighter group. Kapow! And he just appears, and he's automatically... Remember when we talked about the moving as a battle group? Normally, battle groups are ships of a like type, but in this case, the, the fighter can move with the carrier, and he can jump back into the carrier later on if you so desire. So kind of a mobile jump point. Not really, because you can't use him to jump back home or to cross tables, but you know th there's some use there. Fascinating game. Really complex objectives. That's a feature, not a bug. It took me a long time. It took me over a year to get this on the table, but I'm really excited to, to play it. As I said, we'll make this a bonus episode, and then when you tune in next time, I'll have the table all set up. We've already gone through the objectives. We can just dive right in to the first game. Maybe talk a little bit about the solo rules and the campaign. I, I guess maybe we could talk about that. So for a campaign, what you'll do is you start out... I'm going to use Yo-Yo Dynamity Systems. You start out with 10 capital. You start out with a scale 3 mission, and the only ship you have is a light utility ship. You have to purchase and unlock these ship types. So if I want to have a recon wing, a fighter wing, a gunship, you get the free the light utility ships for free. But if I go gunship, recon, and fighter, that's six points. I've only got four credits left over to spend, and you can spend those on upgrade. You've got these competitive advantages. You take one for free, and then you have to kind of unlock these as a tech tree. You can have speed, you can have kind of logistics, you can have uh, endurance, makes it harder to hit this guy, or harder to damage him. He's actually easier to hit, but harder to damage. You've got, the, the aggression is great. If you're willing to take huge risks, you can get big power-ups. I, I, I don't think I like that one. And then helmsmanship just means it's really easy to control. Military means I'm really good at blowing the stuff up. I think we're good. I think you understand the basics, and I think maybe even as soon as tomorrow, we'll play through the first scenario. Till then, I'm praying for you.